on our YouTube channel. So always remember you can go there to find some of our um, past book um, author talks. But it looks like we're having, uh, we're getting, we're getting a lot of you logging in. So I think we can go ahead and officially start. Hello everyone, welcome to PMP Live. My name is Brandy and I am a bookseller in the Children and Teens Department of Politics and Prose. Thanks for turning in to our virtual event where we continue to bring authors and new books to you in the comfort of your own home. Today I have author illustrator Ben Hackey and he will be discussing his new picture book, Julia's House Goes Home, concluding the trilogy that started with Julia's House for Lost Creatures and continued with Julia's House Moved On. Ben Hackey is also the author and illustrator of New York Times bestselling Zeta and the Space Girl trilogy, Nobody Likes a Goblin, and the graphic novels Little Robot and Mighty Jack. We saw a lot of those. He lives and works in the Shenandoah Valley with his wife and their boisterous pack of daughters. For today's event, you can ask Ben a question by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote on your favorite questions by clicking the thumbs up button that will bump them up in the queue. Um, you can also click on the chat to pre-order your own copy of Julia's House Goes Home, which is releasing on October 19th. We do have signed book plates available while supplies last. So I would suggest making your order now so you can snag one of those. Um, and we also have copies of his other two Julia's House books also available for order. Please note that closed captioning is available for today's program. Uh, if you're interested in the captioning, you just want to click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and you will select show subtitle. All right, that is all for me. I'm gonna turn this over to our guest of honor, Ben. Ben. Hello. There you are. Here I am. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's very exciting. Wow. I, I'm, I'm tremendously excited to share this book with you guys. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, I mean, I feel like I say this, I probably say this every time I do a politics and prose event, but, um, I love this bookstore. Politics and Prose was the, the place where I did my very first book signing uh, for Zeta the Space Girl. Um, it was the first time I went to a, to a store and, and got to talk to people about a, a book that I had made. And I, I brought um, my, my, my daughters who were very, very tiny at the time. I, you know, like, uh, I think Julia was like a toddler and then Jonathan was, nine or something like this and you know everybody got um croissants and everybody we went to the coffee shop downstairs and everybody got treats and I made comics about that experience later and uh part of the comic uh, was about how nervous I kind of secretly was um and now all these years later um you've had me back and I noticed when I was looking back through um actually through the emails looking uh, like for the Zoom um, or for the links to the event when I was gonna post those. Um, it is uh, almost a year to the day, one, one day shy of a year uh, since the last time I did uh, uh, an event with you guys. And that was for the previous Julia book, Ju Julia's House Moves On. Um, and so Julia, these books, they've just been, they've been quite a journey for me. Um, it was, 2013 um, or so, 2012, 2013, I had been working on the Zeta books, the Zeta graphic novels, and um, and like like it is with with all of these stories, they they slowly develop in your notes, in my notebooks, my um, my project books, which I always keep. My current project books, I always keep. Um, I keep one big Strathmore sketchbook which is the um, uh, recycled, recycled paper sketchbooks. Uh, I get these because I don't have to be precious about them. Um, and then I also keep uh, uh, a Moleskine or Lichtenstein notebook to keep my, uh, my other notes in. And in the, at that time, uh, like 2012 or whatever, after I was working on the Zeta books, um, another little character, Julia, kind of came into, into my notes. And 
<clears throat> at the time I was also doing little robot comics. And so I, 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 when I look, I, I wish I could have, they're buried, my, those, those sketchbooks are buried in my big pile of sketchbooks. But the first version of Julia was called <laughs> Julia and Her Lion. So it was a very kind of a different concept. Um, but, I, but when I see what a different concept it is, I, and, and I think about the story of other you know, famous children's books, particularly where the wild things are and how much maybe some of the, the story of those books have cha changed through, through their making. Um, the story with where the wild things are is that Maurice Sendak, when he, he worked on it for like on and off, like in little scribbly notes for 10 years or so. And the, the first early version was called, um, I think where the wild horses are or something like this, um, which seems about as different as uh, with my version as uh, Julia and her line becoming Julia and uh, Julia's house for lost creatures. Uh, at, around that time, um, 20, 12, 13, 14, I was also uh, doing a lot of, uh, doing the little comic strips of Little Robot, which those eventually became the book Little Robot, but they started out as a series of comic strips that I was just posting online, really as an exercise in getting back to the newspaper strip format in comics, uh, which has always been a, a, a special format for me, something I've loved. Um, and so in those original, in my original conception, there was a version where Julia and Little Robot, this was the same story. Like it, there was a there was a, a, a version of this where um, it was Julia who's walking along a beach and finds this robot and it was a graphic novel. And then at some point those two stories kind of um, kind of split, separated out like, like cell separation almost. And one of them became the, the book that became Little Robot and the other one became uh, Julia's House for Lost Creatures, which was my first experience with making a picture book with this special format that I <clears throat> grew to love very much, which is the picture book format. Um, in fact, you can see, and I'll, I'm going to try to show you some of these things later, um, but you can see above my head, uh, this is one of the original watercolors from the first uh, Julia book. And that is one of the things that I ended up loving so much about the picture book process is that um, I tend to uh, watercolor my picture. I tend to do like original art. Um, it's all original art, but um, you know, traditional media art for my, my picture books that usually ink and watercolor, right? And so what's really fun about that is at the end, I end up with a bunch of original illustrations and a couple of them have ended up on my walls and that has been very exciting. Um, and it just, that was the book where I fell in love with the, um, I've loved comics for so long, but that was the book where I fell in love with the making of picture books. Um, so, and I don't have an English version right now. So uh, this is, uh, is my Spanish version. This is Julia's House for Lost Creatures. Um, and then some years later, and then like, I never, I never intended to make more Julia's books. The, the Julia trilogy kind of, um, was a concept that grew up, I don't, unconsciously, I didn't, I, I can't remember when I, I feel like there was a point where I had realized that there was more to Julia's story, but I don't know when I became serious about telling her story in three books or whatever this is. Um, so the second book then, uh, which came out last year was, was Julia's House Moves On. And then I had always had this idea of Julia's world being, um, the first book being the first book being about people getting along in one space. The second book being when I started thinking of it as a longer story, the second book being about moving about a house about when you move house and what you can take with you and what you have to leave behind and when plans become winging it right. Um, then the third book I wanted to be like my original intention was for it to be a little bit about how a house slots into a community or how a house slots into, you know, a group of other places. And um, that was the original idea, but it, it, kind of, it kind of changed in the telling a little bit. And um, so what I wanted to do with you guys is I was actually thinking of, um, here is 
uh, Julia's house goes home. And I was thinking of reading this to you guys this evening, um, just doing like a like a little story time, because uh, well, because I it's it's sometimes it's hard to wait to share these books. I love sharing the books so much, but it um, it's something that, that you have to be patient about. It's been a year since I've turned this book in, and um, and you really want to you want to share it and. So this will be, I guess this will be the second time I get to read it to anyone um, live like this. And um, yeah, and the other reason is like, I had, uh, I'd say I'd had, a, I've had as much fun, as much enjoyment making this book as I have any other book that I've worked on. Uh, reason being when I, when I, when I sat down to do the watercolors for this book, they were there's a lot of creatures in this book. So the watercolors were a little ambitious. There was a lot going on. They were, they were a little bit more dense and complex than the original Julia book. And, um, and they were just a blast. I loved the process. What, like, books go through drafts and sometimes you have silly ideas and you have to go through versions of a story so much until you get to the final story. Um, but when I got to the final story of this and when it came time to make the artwork, uh, that's when I get to turn on my, my, I get to turn the speakers up on my music a little bit and just um, make illustrations all day. And that is one of the best parts of the process. So if you'd like, um, if this sounds good and I, I can't see you guys, so I'm going to assume you don't mind, I would like to read to you, Julia's house goes home. So here we go. Um, I'm going to, for my uh, for my own ease, I'm going to take the uh, dust jacket off and put that aside, and we will we will do it this way. So Julia's house goes home. Our story actually begins on the end papers, and as you can see, I'm going to try to. In Large my own screen so I can see myself a little bit. Oh, there we go, much better. Okay, so our story begins on the end papers and we can see Julia's house floating amongst the clouds, which is where we left her at the end of the last book. Up in the sky, not knowing where she was going to go. But now the house is floating downward. It kind of releases its, its balloon, its kind of organic balloon. And, its tendrils come out and it starts walking along the ridge line. Yes, this is <laughs> this is our family copy. Julia's house goes home. Here goes the house along the ridge line. There's Julia looking out into the into what lies ahead. Julia's house goes home. Here's Julia with her little spyglass looking ahead toward adventure. And looking into the distance, to see something, a place shining in the distance. Julia's house roamed the high hills looking for a home. Here's all her lost creatures. And so when Julia saw the perfect spot glittering in the distance, she told her creatures, that's where we're going. And the creatures all cheered. But the way down, but the path from the high hills to the valley was rocky and rough. And there's the, the house wiggling as it goes down the hill on spindly legs. Be careful, shouted Julia, but it was too late. And many of these things in her, in her house we've seen in all the other books, the globe, the chair, that teapot has, has appeared in every, every one, the, this portrait has been in every one, the Viking statue there, this little robot, the, the globe, the snow globe, some of her things, and then trip, snap. Julia's house rolled away without Julia.
down, oops, sorry, down, down, down she fell. When Julia sat up, she was in a deep, dark place. She had nothing left but the sign from her door. But there was a tunnel ahead, so she followed that. And very astute readers will see the little rat and a little crown, which might make us think of nobody likes a goblin. Just as Julia was getting really lonely, a familiar face appeared in the dark. It was patched up Kitty. Come on, said Julia. Let's go find our house. And here they are emerging from the tunnel. Into the open. The cave opened onto a shadowy wood. The house had surely come this way. Goblins and filet were scattered about. Follow me, called Julia. We're off to find our house. And yeah, they're all following her. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of a parade. They walked on until a sweet voice cut through the gloom. It was a unicorn. I found your mermaid, it said. The mermaid asked if the unicorn could come along. Julia looked at her sign, the one that meant welcome to all lost creatures. We'll make room, she said. Um, just a side, now we come to maybe my favorite pages. Um, the path to the house led through the gates of a graveyard. The ghost was there, having drifted from the house as it rolled with a host of specters and shades. We'll make room, said Julia. Just follow me. On and on they marched, and everywhere it was the same. Old friends found, new faces joining in. There were more lost creatures in the world than Julia had ever imagined. They all saw her sign and followed. We'll make room, she told them all. But she began to wonder. When they stopped to rest, the creatures all talked about tea and toast and warm beds for everyone. Julia sat apart, wondering turned to worry. There won't be enough room, she said to herself. But still, she led them on until bump. Julia looked down at the battered knob from her front door and she knew she had to tell them. Attention please, Julia called. The creatures all looked up at her with their teeth and talons and horns. Julia took a deep breath. 
I have something to say, she began. It's about the house. But before she could continue, the ground began to shake. Did someone say house? A voice rumbled. It was a mountain king, the largest of all trolls. A house rolled across my head and just over that hill, it said. Wasn't much left of it, though. Hooray! The creatures shouted, cheered. We're almost there. Keep going. Julia gathered up her sign and climbed the last hill. And there it was, the perfect spot. It was the very spot she'd seen glimmering in the distance. Except it wasn't perfect. What Julia had seen was nothing but the sun glinting off the scraps in a junkyard. And there was nothing left of Julia's house but the front door. Julia put the doorknob back on her door and put down her sign, and she put down her sign, the one that meant all are welcome. She turned to the creatures who had all followed her on the long march across the countryside. I'm sorry, she said, I let you down. Let us down, they said, never. We have everything we need. And they rush off. The creatures set to work. They worked for a long time. And together, they made a new home. with room for everyone. They called it Julia's Town. The end. And if you've been following Patched Up Kitty's story, there's a small epilogue on the end paper. And that is the end. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's really, I really enjoyed reading it aloud. I enjoy reading this book aloud. I'm noticing now that I'm doing it. Um, so let me check the time here. We've got, oh, we've got, we've got some time. Um, I thought uh, we're going, eventually we're going to be doing um, some questions, but I thought really quickly, um, if you'd like, I will um, flip my screen around and give you a small tour of my workspace uh, because because uh, it's clean right now, which is not as common as I'd like. So let me see if I can. Um, OK, here we go. Are you guys ready? It's very small. I work in a single one room space that we um, when we first moved here, before it was finished off into a studio, we called it the shed. Uh, now it's, uh, we still call it the shed. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll give you a little tour. Here we go. Here is my desk. 
this is where I did all of those illustrations that we just that we just went through. I I I actually drew and watercolored them all right here. Um, and looking over my shoulder at the time was uh, some of the original original pieces for for the first Julia's house, which I which I keep above my above my desk. Here's Julia's house coming to its spot by the sea. Um, a lot of reflection here. Here is Julia opening the door and finding those all those creatures waiting for her that first that first time. Here is uh, <laughs> this is my uh, a version of Thorin's map that I made for myself. A friend gave me a a roll of um, textured wallpaper, which is what that was. It was really hard to draw on, but um, but the map turned out okay. Um, Above my this used to be my this used to be my reference bookshelf, but now it's my hat collection. Not that I ever started collecting hats; they just seem to accumulate. Um, this is the old back door to my studio, which I turned into a bookshelf. Here's a mask from a festival. Um, so on the top shelf, we have uh, some wonderful graphic novels. Many of whom, uh, like, like, this is my special shelf of graphic novels. A lot of them are made by, I don't know, friends and people I know, and uh, or or books that really struck me particularly. It's the shelf of favorite books. Here is uh, art reference, and this lo lowest shelf here is very important. These are some of my old sketchbooks. And I think that. Um, Filling sketchbooks is is probably the main key to any kind of artistic or any kind of uh, writing and drawing pursuit. Uh, there is the ladder, and that goes up to the loft. The loft used to be uh, was originally conceived of as a book storage and special writing place, but now it's where my my daughters go to play iPad games. The secondary shelf is is um, starting to come into its own. I just put that up recently. This is a very important space. This is the light table. This is where I make, um, this is where I do any kind of, um, I don't know, tracing work, extra work that I need to do. Uh, sometimes I'll print out illustrations and clean them up on the light table. Um, this is a cutout from a big um, mural piece that I did, art from friends. My very first Superman cape from when I was a little baby. That was, a, that, was, that, that was one of my first garments. <laughs> and uh, down here we have all the extra Zeta Space Girl, Mighty Jack. Mostly, most, these are mostly translations. Uh, these are mostly uh, um, books in the, the books in other languages and some juggling rings. So really, honestly, this is it. This is, this is where I work. Um, this is my, my special space. And uh, and there we go. So I'm gonna turn this back around. Oh, there's my little wood stove. When it gets really chilly in here, I light, light that up. And it gets cozy. When it's really winter time, it gets cozy at about three o'clock in the afternoon, which is, which it was, anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how I do my work and where I do my work. I'm gonna try to, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm going to leave everything set the way it is. Um, okay. And, uh, and with that, I wondered if um, we might move on if you guys had any questions for me. Um, the only other thing I might show you very quickly uh, now that we're talking, I told you, um, well, I mean, I showed you, I showed you guys about um, the, the two, my, my key to making stories is these two notebooks. So I had, I had marked pages in these to show you kinds of things I'm working on now. Um, so notebook pages. Notebook pages, like my key to notebooks is they can be a mess. They can just be, I, I love the idea of not being precious about notebooks um, and just, just they're there to catch ideas as they fall out of your brain. So I like the idea of keeping your notebooks messy and um, not fussy, not, not worrying about everything coming out just right. So anyway, yeah, that's a uh, that's a bit of the process. So anyway, yeah, let's uh, it, let's uh, let's go to questions if we've got them. 
Great. Thanks for sharing your sketch, uh, your sketches that I think that was someone had, had else had mentioned that they were interested in that. So oh, okay. you're well, anticipating our needs so well. Cool. Um, and I can flip see. through here and find a bits and bobs more as we talk too, if you want. Yeah. Oh, you have so, okay. You have so many questions. Nice. Yeah. Um, I want to start with some questions about this book. So I'm just looking um, for, there was one in particular. Let's see. Oh, I love this question by Amadia, who's six. Um, and I think I'm interested in this because you've, you've done this character now three times. Is it hard to draw Julia the, the same way again and again? Um, it is. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, what I like to do is uh, in notebooks, I will draw characters over and over again um, as a way to get to know them and as a way to get to know how they move, how they behave. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that's important to get comfortable with the character. And um, so there are many more drawings of the character that aren't in the books uh, uh, that, that sort of inform what ends up in the books. Um, the other thing is I like to, I, Consciously and unconsciously, I like to change my characters a little bit um, from, you know, it, it, from book to book, right? Um, I, I was even noticing the other day, uh, just uh, if you'll look, uh, Julia has definitely changed from, from the first book to, to now. Let's see how I can, there we go. Um, she's grown a bit. She's wearing a completely they're the same colors. She kind of has the same colors and, and, and style that she drifts to, but her outfit is actually quite quite different. Um, so from the first to the third. And she seems to get a, a, um, a little bit older. And that also, uh, I think, unconsciously happens to my characters. I think I imagine them spending, when I'm in those years when I don't make a book, I, st I feel like they're still growing a little bit um, on their own. So, um, so yeah, but it's also fun. It's also fun to try to get uh, characters to stay stay the same. Uh, one last thing I'll say about that is it is it's always interesting to me to look at um, newspaper comic strip characters that I like. Uh, Garfield and Calvin are two the two prime examples. And if you look at the you know the first Garfield comic and the the latest Garfield comic. You'll see how different Garfield looks. How he's he's changed. His little character design has changed through years. And Calvin is the same way in Calvin and Hobbes. Like um, the look of Calvin from the first strip to the last is is quite different. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a good thing. I like I like getting new little characters that way. Great, that's a great question. And I never really thought about that before. But you're right. Uh, you see it in many um, popular characters. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, Jamie um, loved your book and it was her first time with a Julia book. So oh, wow. she's, uh, now she's going to have to go back and, and read yeah. the others. But she was wondering with the original house, um, were you inspired by Baba Yaga's hut, the one that runs on legs? Oh, um, yeah, I do. I have a lot of, yes, definitely. Uh, especially once it starts sprouting the, uh, uh, the sort of rooty, um, claw-like uh, um, spindly appendages. Yeah, that's definitely Baba, Baba Yaga-ish. I'm not exactly sure where the turtle came from. The first time we see Julia's house in the first book, it's it's perched on the back of a giant turtle. And it's, um, I just love, I love the idea of traveling houses. I love the idea of a house that is able to, it's, a, it's the perfect fantasy to be able to take your absolute comfortable place with you but also go to different places, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and so Julia's house is also fairly inspired by, uh, we, uh, from when I was like mm, two to 13, 14, um, we lived in a very old, like a Victorian house uh, was where my family lived. And I feel like there's a lot of Julia's house in that house or a lot of that house to translate into Julia's house, right? Um, and to the point that um, in the first book, uh, really quick, I'll show you this really, really quickly. Uh, I put little Easter eggs in it just, just for my sisters. <laughs> Julia's, there you go. Julia's, Julia's front door here 
uh, is very similar to that door of that house where we grew up, where we grew up, especially with the with the doorbell right on the inside, in the smack dab in the middle on the inside. And when this book um, came out, uh, one of the first things that happened was my sister called me on the phone, and she was like, "That's the that's the doorbell from Case and Street." And she was like, "That's the door from Case and Street." Like, yes, like like only you and my other sister would have noticed that, right? So. Um, so yeah, it's also, I'm segueing into answering a question that was not asked, which is, it's really fun to put little little Easter eggs and surprises and little bits into your books, um, things for your own house and stuff, so. Very nice. I'm gonna have to look at the books more closely now, see what I missed. Um, um, let's see, Maria uh, is asking um, if there's any possibility are uh, there any other stories for goblin rattling around? And if not, if not Julia's house, um, what what might we expect next? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, I love the goblin. I love nobody likes a goblin. I loved making that book so much. That was one of my other best picture book experiences. And so I think about that a lot. But I also just kind of like it being what it is. And I don't think I will make another, another book of Nobody Likes a Goblin or with Goblin Skeleton unless it's very, unless I'm very clearly sure that that's, um, that it's going to be special. So currently I draw Goblin a lot. He appears in my sketchbooks a lot, but he doesn't seem to have quite a narrative yet. So I guess time will tell. Um, currently I'm working on a book. Um, here's a, here's a picture from my sketchbook. Um, I think I, sh I showed this already, but this is um, uh, little bits um, of, of what I'm working on now. And it's um, a very different book. Uh, it's a graphic novel um, and it's, a, it's an underworld journey. So it's about a boy who goes down into his basement and keeps going down. Um, and that's all I probably could, should say about it just yet, but um, but it's fun. And I'm, I'm kind of like, um, it's hard with characters because you, you you grow to love them. And even I think like, I wonder what, you know, I wonder what they're up to now. Like, like you want their stories to continue and continue, but then there's other stories rattling around there too. And it's hard to sometimes know with your limited time, like which, which avenues to pursue. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the things that's coming up next. I'm working on my, my Reynard the Fox story to um, so yeah, there's different things coming along. Very, that's very intriguing. You've piqued our interest. So we'll have to, we'll, we can't wait to see what's next. Um, Carmen uh, it asks, what was one thing you learned while making this book? Ooh. One thing I learned making this book would probably be a thing that I have learned before, but forget often. And that is to, <clears throat> to kind of trust the process or to trust, trust, the, trust the act of storytelling, trust the process of storytelling. One of, the, one of the things that seems to happen with every book that I make is that um, I'll get to the point where, because they go through so many drafts and so many versions, um, Nobody Likes a Goblin is a good example of what I'm talking about. A lesson that I learned in that book, same lesson I learned in this book, which I completely forget every time, um, which is the book will start out not very good. <laughs> It'll start out pretty rough and pretty not great. And there are all these moments where you're like, I should just throw the whole book out. This is ridiculous. What am I even doing? Like maybe this was a bad idea. And then you'll see a shiny new idea. Well, I should just not do this Julia book. I should do this shiny new idea that I know will turn out perfectly. It's not going to be any better. It's just, it's just different and it's not made. And so Julia's house um, went through about eight drafts. Um, I mean, this specific Julia's house book went through about eight drafts. And I had to relearn that that is normal for, for these books. Even you think like, oh, it's a picture book. It's like 30 some pages. It's like 32, 38 pages. It should be, should be easy. But even that, even it's um, brevity, even it's um, constraint by that 
you know, short page number makes it its own kind of challenge. Um, Nobody Likes a Goblin started out as a book called, <clears throat> started out as a book called Goblins Don't Like Ice Cream. And it was about a little boy who was moving and the, the, the family was doing different things to cheer him up. And he was just full of anger about this and could call a goblin horde up. And, uh, and they would make all, all kinds of like chaos and mischief. And it's like, it went through so many versions until I realized like, I'm not interested in any of these kids' stories. I'm actually interested in the goblins for this one. And um, that's where I learned like, you know, just stick with it, trust, trust the process, make all the bad versions of the book and be patient. Patience, I guess. Patience is the thing. Uh, like working on it and realizing that it just, it just takes a while. Um, I guess that, like, I mean, yes, that's what I learned from this book. Uh, I also learned like, layer on watercolors a little more, um, pop out the, the colors more, I don't know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's not a very interesting answer. Uh, uh, no, it is, it's very interesting. Um, okay, Laura has a sort of a multi-part question. Um, she would like to know whether you um, intended for Zeta and Jack to meet or did that come about as you worked on it? And also, uh, do you consider all of your characters to exist in the same universe? She noticed there's a lot of crossover in the art, so she was curious. And she says, thank you. Her entire family loves your books. Oh, so the first part of that. You. So the first um, part of that is Zeta and Jack. Did you uh, always Zeta intend Jack. that? I did not always intend that. that those, those two stories developed uh, quite independently. Um, though I was working on them both at the same time, but uh, toward the set, and, and, and Mighty Jack was originally supposed to be a single book. I was just gonna make one book uh, with, um, but it, it got longer and longer. And then my, um, my dear editor said, uh, looked at the outline for the book and, and she was like, this, this seems like a lot for one book. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's fine. Like, it, it's, it'll be fine. And then, um, you know, I started fleshing out the outline and started doing the thumbnails. And then I had to call her back and be like, you were right, it's a lot for one book, it's too much. So what I ended up doing was um, splitting Mighty Jack into basically Mighty Jack and Mighty Jack and the Goblin King, two parts. Um, and then, like, but Mighty Jack and the Goblin King was really just the, the 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 last third of the story that I originally intended to tell. So that story grew as I was writing it, which was very exciting. And then somewhere along that, I was like, "Oh, wow! What if? What if as an ep like? I really just intended it as like a little button, like a little epilogue. Like, what if at the end? And then they, they you know, like they." They go and they find and Zeta the space girls. I was like, oh, this would be so cool. And like, you know, I just thought, oh, this is this is so fun. But then they my my then you know called my editor back and she was like, this is really cool. But if you do that, you realize you have to make that book also. Like you can't just you can't just throw this out there and not do it. And so I was like, oh, okay. Um, which turned out to be great. I really like I really liked like. Um, I felt like it was like marveling it up too much, like making like this whole like universe stories collide kind of thing, but it was so much fun um, that I'm glad. And those, and the universe, those worlds ended up meshing together better than I would have hoped or better than I would have expected. Um, the only reason I wouldn't do it again is that uh, it's a lot of characters to juggle. Um, trying to get everybody to have all the little side characters. You, like they, you all want, you want them to, as many as you can to have their own special little scene. And even then I was, I felt like I was shortchanging uh, certain characters. Um, second part of the question though, um, do they all exist in one universe? Um, I feel like, I feel like uh, my graphic novel characters like this is a super nerdy answer and I don't want to be held to this forever but my my feeling about these worlds is that uh, the graphic novel characters all exist so far 
in a universe, in a shared sort of universe. So, um, so little robot like uh, Jack does pass the, the the little girl from Little Robot in the flea market in in that first book. Um, I briefly thought about pulling her into the big crossover book, but it was like that was way too much. Um, so, so I feel like, and then like uh, nobody likes a goblin and Julia. I feel like they're um, they're sort of in the same world also but maybe vastly different times in that world. And then like with those books, I just like to, I like to intersperse. I like to do all of the, like the, I just like to put little bits in. I like to say like, and, and that world's a little bit more amorphous, uh, more can happen. Um, so anyway. so so we, we shouldn't be um, wishing for Zeta and Jack to come upon Julia in one of their future adventures. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, maybe. yeah, I think that's, there, there you go, there you go. Yeah, I think like Zeta and Jack uh, and, and then Julia's world will probably not collide. That's, no. that's safe to say. Never say never. You never say never. <laughs> you never know what's going on. <laughs> Just a few, we had a few people ask if there uh, is somewhere that they can buy prints of your artwork to hang up in their kids' rooms or, or is there somewhere? Currently, no. Um, I keep thinking I'll have time to figure that out. Um, yeah, business idea, if there's interest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At, the present, at the present time, I don't have prints available, but I but it's on the list of, it's on the to-do list, definitely. And if you keep an eye on my stuff, I um, will definitely post about it if I do. Excellent. Uh, Rebecca Piazza um, says, hello again, Ben. Any Hi, Rebecca. I'm so glad you're here. Wow. <laughs> Any words with them for the aspiring kids book author illustrators? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, fill those sketchbooks, make things and share things. Um, they're, 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 I feel like they're different skills, making and sharing. Um, some of us are better at um, the, the the quiet, alone part of 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 sitting with your creations and 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 um, making the things. Uh, some of us are good. It's a, I feel like it's a it can be stressful or different skill to to find your way of sharing your stuff. But really, it's about um, it's about tossing those little bottles out into the out into the world, um, which is not businessy advice but I feel like it's part of what the, the the job is right and finding people who finding and connecting with people who who do work that you admire they're similar to yours and that's something that um I'm not exactly sure how it is now but like it was a real gift for when I sort of came into starting out was that I, I was I was truly able to find really on, on message boards and stuff uh, a group of artists that was doing um, similar work and, and we were able to share our work and talk about each other's work and, and that's one of the things that helps me get um, that connect, those connections were something that allowed me to get a lot better and exploring also like like doing a lot of finding more and more and more work that you love that's that's a big thing it's just just realizing how much world there is out there. Um, <clears throat> and there's the, how, how there's always more like amazing work to find and like, and, and go on divergent paths, right? Um, like find work that doesn't quite plug into the children's book space, but is still like, like artistically knocks your socks off, right? Um, like, you know, that's, that's a visit to the National Gallery or whatever it is. So, yeah, I mean, those aren't, I know that's not a lot of concrete stuff, but, but I truly believe like the, I, I truly believe like the, the, the act of making, making a habit of creativity is um, getting to the point where you're, you're grumpy if you haven't sat down and written or drawn that day, that that's probably about it. Um, and then trying to find a way to connect. Not the best, not, not the most concrete, but, but I think that that's how it is. Well, along those same lines, Ben, um, we have Darby who is five years old, who loves your books. 
Um, do you have any advice specifically for a young kid who wants to be an artist someday? Yes. Um, um, my advice is to, uh, I'll say three things. Um, if you really want to be an artist every day, or if you really want to be an artist, uh, be an artist every day. So always be drawing. Um, number two is um, stay loose. Don't worry about your drawings being super good because these are your, this is just, this is your, every drawing is a practice, right? Um, every drawing is not the, the drawing. So don't worry, just draw. And, um, and also like, that's why I like, that's why I like cheap sketchbooks with recycled paper is because I don't have to, I have sometimes, sometimes I make a mistake and the mistake is that I buy uh, fancy, beautiful sketchbooks. And then I feel like, well, every, every drawing in this book has to be uh, as beautiful as the book or has to, you know, like it has to be its own little art, perfect art object. And then what ends up happening is I don't draw in the book very much or I draw in the book and I'm unhappy. Um, but that never happens with cheap sketchbooks with rip out paper uh, because you don't have to worry so much. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows you to free yourself up and draw every day. Last thing would be um, to draw um, and write about or create about uh, the world around you. Um, which is a funny thing for me to say because I draw so many um, <laughs> robots and creatures and all of this stuff. But, but I would still say that if you look at the, the books, yes, there's a lot of creatures. Yes, there's a lot of stuff. But a lot of it is pulled from, from the world outside my door, from the world inside my house, from, from around me. Um, the, the, the teapot in Julia's house is, we have that teapot in the house. That's where that teapot came from. Um, and I do spend a lot of time drawing, um, like my kids, I spend a lot of time drawing people. I spend a lot of time, um, if I go, if I have a few minutes to sit somewhere and there's people milling about, I will try to draw them as quickly and sketchily as I can. Um, definitely, I always have, have, have that kind of thing floating around in the books. Um, yeah, stuff like, stuff like this, it's just like, just really quick stuff, right? Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, those are my, those are my three main things. Excellent. Well, I wish we have so many good, good questions and, uh, unfortunately we're just out of time. So thank you everyone who, uh, contributed a question and thank you, Ben, for, uh, inspiring us all and for giving us a sneak peek into your world and how you work. And thank uh, all of you guys for letting me read, uh, or for, for coming here and, 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 and being so hospitable and letting me read, uh, Julia's house goes home to you. It's still, it's still thrilling to be able to read this book to people because you wait to read these things. You wait to share. Yeah, well, your, your calendar is going to be full. You're going to get to talk about it a lot. Uh, uh, but we're glad we could be uh, one, of your, one of your first readings and uh, uh, we enjoyed our sneak preview. Uh, one more thing. I forgot to show you. I'm wearing my Julia shoes. So Julia, oh. <laughs> I got these just for, I, and I, I put them on because I'm like, okay, I'm doing a Julia thing. And, uh, and that's, my, that's my one last, uh, my one last little thing. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right. So everybody, you can still click on the link to, in the chat to purchase your copy of Julia's house goes home. And we do have some signed book plates while supplies last. So uh, go for it. Uh, you can also go to our website to find out about other upcoming programs. Uh, just go to uh, the Children and Teens tab on pelicans-pros.com. Oops. <laughs> Still with us. Uh, and then uh, if you click on events from our website, uh, Children and Teens page, you will see our calendar of events. You can also view our past events on our YouTube channel. All right. So... Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Ben. It was such a pleasure to have you. Thank and you. Uh, we'll uh, see you again, hopefully soon for whatever comes next. One of my favorite stories. Thank you.